So I can see here, it's actually indicating. He's recording right now. I gave him the recording. Recording. I can see that, I can, I can see that it is. Okay. You know, I want to check the now, audio quality of people. We will be able to hear ourselves better. We won't check the- But can uh, you hear me? Me, I, I hear can you. hear you very well. Now can you hear me very well? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I can Let see that uh, one of our guests is available. Uh, Abdullah Idris. Yes, Abdullah Idris is available. Okay. Hey, please, Abdullah, where is Abdullah? I can see Aisha also coming Abdullah on. Adam, it's Abdullah Idris. Abdullah yes. Adam Idris. Yes, Abdullah Adam Idris. Abdullah Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brothers? Good afternoon, um, gentlemen. Um, but as, as we're about to start, you're going to like mute everyone who will just be able to hear the people who will be sharing what the that we are um, going to be doing. So whenever it's time for you to now talk, you can now also. I can't see you, Abdullah Adam Idris. Okay, I can see him right now. Abdullah, do you know, do me a favor? The sun, the sun light is actually making your face black. Maybe you turn your okay. chair. Oh, it's coming. Okay, let me turn around there. Ideally, you're supposed to come from the west. Is someone at work now? Okay. I Maybe say Samuel Aruaye. Samuel, I can, I'll, I'll check Samuel also. Abdullah, I'm trying to check Abdullah's light so it will be cool. Is there um, power supply there so you could just maybe put on the light a bit so people could see your face clearly? Abdullah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. The audio is very poor. I'm hearing you were not that audible. I can hear you loud and clear. Are you hearing me well? Can you hear me now? No. Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay, what I said is sit in such a way that the light will reflect on your face. Let this start. Okay. Just look like your, your okay. profile. We get power supply. Because it's oh, we have a power supply. Uh, are we are we okay? Okay. Mr. Kamil, are we okay? Yes, yes. Um I'm I'm I'll be with you in a minute. I want to check something. Uh, where is um, Samuel? Let me check Samuel if Samuel is also there. I can't see Samuel. I can't see Samuel. Or oh, is Samuel having a name? Hello? I can't see Samuel. Hi, good evening, everyone. Samuel um, is here. Okay. I am. I need to Hi, good evening. I'm trying to see fish. Okay, Samuel, I can see Samuel. Okay, no. Um, Samuel, I'm trying to I, reach somewhere now. I can see the picture. I'd like to see if he is face uh, if he's going to come up here physically or if you see it with the picture because I want to see the picture quality so it will be well enough for us to see your face. And see, 
allow people to see you clearly. Aruna, are you? Hey, hello. Okay, I met Sahidu. Mr. Hamid. Yeah, yeah. I think you have a message on the chat box. A private I message. Mr. Yeah, Wale Hassan, is that you? I can see you quickly. Yes, I am on the bus and we have to use a mask. That's why. I can see, I can tell, I can see, I can see. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, um, Aruna, I you. Ahmed Saidu and Al Hassan Maji. I think We're waiting for uh, like some people to kickstart this meeting, and um, I'll, I'll because I'm sorry, I think we should start. Even though we have difficulties in uh, network, my okay, message is very fast. Hello, everybody. Please, I am Abu. Abu, uh, I'm about to so kindly do me a favor. Kindly mute every other person there except mine. Okay. Please, okay. Um, every, okay, mute everyone. Okay. Or let me do it now here from here. Hey, no, 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 Almost everyone. Okay. No, I can call Adam's um, still on. Anyway, because I don't want um, interfer uh, interference. Okay. Okay. In the hierarchy of human needs, food plays a vital role in the life of man. No wonder everyone could do without some order Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but without food, you can barely survive. Hello and welcome. Here is One Nigeria Platform, um, a Hello, platform will put together like minds and they're about to the mindset 
of the 1960s. I was, I was trying Name to you to you a look at. Hello. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. I saw you. I can see you. Yeah. Abu, I've actually started, and I would like everyone okay, to. Okay, go ahead. Like Hello and welcome. This is One Nigeria Platform, a platform that brings about Nigerian citizens with like minds and trying to put them on a pedestal to redefine the goal, the vision of what a true Nigeria is. Nigeria, as you know, is a country that is populated by majority of youth. And we see these youths supposed to be the strike force of the country brings about economic upturn. But what we see is a reverse. This is one of the reasons why this platform was put into bear, to make sure it sounds like a, a checks and balance to checkmate the excesses of those people in the polity. Hello and welcome. I am Hamid Bakari, and this is one platform on in JJ television. Today, our spotlight will be geared towards the agricultural business. And today I have two get, um, guests who will be doing justice to that. And also we'll be having some participants like I already have them, you can see them here, who will be making valuable contribution. They can see what they can learn from this and what they can take home to make sure we have um, econo an agri economic in Nigeria. I sat with Abdullahi Adam Idris. Abdullahi Adam Idris is an agri seed entrepreneur is a consultant, is a trainer, and he's also a coach. Let me give you a brief uh, profile of Adam. Adam Idris is, um, uh, he has a BSc in agriculture from University of Maiduguri, and he also has an MSc in agronomy from Bayero University, Kano. MD Seeds Pears Ventures Limited, which engage in production of marketing of agricultural seeds and seedlings. He's a trainer, like I rightly said, and he's a coach on farmers, business school, cooperative business school, agribusiness startups. The next is Samuel. Samuel is the CEO, CEO of um, Slate Farms. Samuel or Arura is the business development manager in a consulting firm, then moved back to Nigeria in 2016 to start Slate Farms. A product manager by training with a business development background this changes view of how agriculture should be managed, hence it needs agribusiness. Very passionate about startup growth and how to affect agro-industry in Nigeria. So now you have it. We have our two guests there, but we also have some participants and to see how they can learn from this. Um, I have some questions here. This, th these two people aren't just the only people who have been doing some things in, uh, in agriculture. As we know in Nigeria, for economic based country. Though we started with agriculture before okay. before the, of the colonial masses, but at the end turn we Thank had the, um, going. Okay, hello, hello, and. First, I have some questions. You know, um, agri business. I'm my, my my question goes to Adam Idris as a consultant. What do you think we are not getting right because we have a land filled with milk and honey, and yet we import majority. Like for instance, Nigeria eats um, about forty thousand metric tons of rice yearly, part of which is actually imported. In a land that has milk and honey, fertile land, you must say, but uh, before this administration, that's what they've been consuming. But we thank God that we now have um, this administration who's actually embracing agriculture. What's your take on um, having individuals as a Nigerian youth who are not employed and um, how can they go agri and make a better living out of it? Because they see it as um, um, a tool whereby only those people in the villages, the peasant people, 
can um, actually do business in. What would you say, um, um, uh, Adam Abdullah? How would you, how would you, how would you um, try to like call the attention to be a participant into the agri business? Hello, Adam, can you hear me? Abu? Hello, Hello Adam. Abu can you hear me? me? Yeah, my question. It's like he's having difficulties. Okay, okay. let me go to Samuel. 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 What's your role take about just going into agri culture? Is it viable? And why should we um, go? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please speak. Okay. Um, first of all, my name is Samuel, Samuel Arua, and um, uh, you've, you've introduced me already. Um, I'm the CEO of Slate Farms. And, um, um, so let me, hit, let me hit your question straight. Um, what is... Um, uh, please, please rephrase the question again so I can be able to coin my words better. Okay, can you rephrase the question? Why did you go into farming? Okay, so let me link. Let me link what you um, said earlier and this question. Um, so ideally, when, when we talk about agriculture, so uh, uh, when we talk about agriculture, uh, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is farming. Okay, and the first thing that comes to everybody's everybody's mind is farming. And when you tell someone, "I'm a farmer." The first thing that comes to their mind is um, there's a stereotype we have that um, is he he's not rich. Um, he's one of the lowest pay, paid persons on, on this strata of 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 workforce, and um, he's in debt business with no huge returns, or with no sensible returns. That it, um, that is, it is hard and all that and all that. But one of the things that people don't get is that. Farming it is uh, as um, one of the least form of agriculture. Okay, farming in itself is. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Go on, speak. Yeah, farming in itself. So farming in itself is one of the least form of agriculture. Farming in itself is it's one of the lowest form of agriculture. Again, and so at the end of the day, a lot of people mistake farming for the entirety of agriculture so let me come back to the last um to the to your question why did i come why did i um get into agriculture so let's state it emphatically that um yes we are my company slave farms we, we're into primary production primary production meaning farming but that is not the only thing that we do agri-tech business okay uh, so there's a whole lot of technology and a whole lot of um um, data we're using in our businesses. But well, in answering your question, this is what I'll say. Um, Samuel, do you have that child with you there? Could you? Okay, uh, hold on. Hold on. I, I think I need to step up. Um, just give me a second. <laughs> okay, meanwhile, okay, now let me give hold you, let me, let, me, let me give you a synopsis here. Uh, that... people... Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so back to what I was saying. Uh, there's, there's a dichotomy between um, farming and agriculture. Um, uh, 2016, 2016, I, I realized, in fact, 2015, I realized that I need to come back to Nigeria because um, at 2015, I, I had been studying the transformation agenda, the 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 policy for the transformation plan for agriculture, and um, that was during Good Luck's um, uh, Good Luck's um, regime. I, I saw, I watched in the progression of how um, agriculture used to be Sika 1999. I watched the progression of agriculture from 1999 to 2007. Okay, remember I used to work in a consulting firm, 
Now, one of the things we did, we, um, I, and I used to be a business development manager. We did a lot of jobs in, West, in Francophone West Africa. And in doing a lot of jobs in Francophone West Africa, um, I saw how the food structure was. Now, there are three basic things that you need to understand. People are always going to eat. In, on the um, Maslow hierarchy of needs, okay? People are always going to eat. People are always going to look for shelter. And people are always going to look for how to better themselves. So anybody who... Now, the first and most important is eating. Our population is growing by 2.7% um, uh, per annum. And in this growth, it means that people are always going to want to, as the population increases, people are always going to want to eat more. More babies are going to be born, meaning that you need more wheat-based food. In fact, more grain food. You need more rice. You need more maize. You need more, you need more wheat. You need more fish. You need more meat. Everybody's going to eat as the population increases. Our mortality rate is low, and, uh, but our birth rate is high. When you look at, so it's a game of numbers. Okay. Hey, hey, let me, I'd like to stop you there because yep. can we get Abdullah here? If Abdullah here, what I'm trying to say is this because when you mention agriculture, the yep. first thing that comes to the minds of people is oh, a farmer or uh, maybe plantation of rice, um, Very yams. True. Very true. There is true. more to it. A whole lot of people do not know. That's Very one true. of the reasons. For this <laughs> There's on agriculture and how we can move millions out of it and how we can create employment out of it. I take this instance. You heard about um, as this young man in 2017. Uh, he was 35 years then. He was a journalist and he navigated into um, agriculture. He goes by the name Rotimi Williams. Rotimi Williams has the second largest rice plantation in Nigeria or in, I say in Nigeria or in Africa. And how did he go by it? It is not just about that. It, we have, um, what's it called? Um, um, you have storage facilities in check. You have, uh, people can take that into consideration. You have um, um, the challenges also, and you have what it is to take. This forestation, is it happening? Hello? So, I feel like I uh, can, um, when can you have, a nice mechanized way of actually farming, you could get the dividend of farming, of agriculture, and you could do business. It starts from the substantial farming to the market. But what we also dwell in, we often dwell at in the market, which is the substantial kind of farming. It, um, out here, we want to educate ourselves and we want to see the way forward from doing things to, like reinventing the wheel. Let me start with fertilizer, which is very, very germane to farmers in rural areas. In, in 2017, um, the government actually commissioned the largest fertilizer in the world, which was in LMA in Port Harcourt. How has this affected the growth of agribusiness in Nigeria since then up until now? Samuel? Samuel? I can't hear you. C please, could you unmute yourself? Can you hear me Abu? better now? Can you hear me now? Hello. Abu, Hello. Yeah, can I call unmute them about to speak? Okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, the question is how has, how has fertilizer improved um, agriculture and farming activities in Nigeria, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, I, I need to I need to state some facts. That's a challenge for I said how has that affected positively? Okay. Um, so that's what I'm going. I'm, I'm trying to answer. How has um, fertilizer affected the growth of agriculture in Nigeria, right? That's since the question. The, since the commitment of that particular largest fertilizer. See, I want us to know the nitty gritty of this. What, see, I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm like on the fence. I'm for you people, and I'm also check, 
taking the, what the government have actually said they are doing. Because okay. if, let me, let me I, finish can, my thing. Yeah, okay. They commissioned the largest fertilizer in the world. How has it affected the agribusiness in Nigeria? Can I be candid with you? Can I oh, be very frank? Yes, be candid. You have to be candid. Yes. yes, so let me be very frank. It, it does not done much difference. Be candid here. So it has, it has, there has not been much difference. The reason why I'm going to tell you that there's not been much difference is one, uh, the buying power of the average farmer has not increased between 2015 and 2020. Okay? The purchasing power of the average farmer has not increased between 2015 to 2020. The um, price of fertilizer, okay, the price of fertilizer has not really changed between 2015 and 2020. In fact, right now, the price of fertilizer is way more expensive. Do you understand? One would say it is readily, it is more readily available. Well, come to think of it. Take a look at somebody saying the government has put in place good policies regarding agriculture. However, the implementation and practices are, are at a rudimentary state. I'll still come back to this. Uh, I, I like to, I, I'm not, I'm not partisan. Okay. I'm not partisan. And uh, I like to be very, very clear about a lot of things. Um, fertilizer in itself. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, um, just so we're clear. Yeah. Let's be clear of what fertilizer is. Fertilizer is, um, any natural or manufactured plant nutrient that contains at least 5% of one or more primary, uh, one or more primary nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Now, the element plants that you're talking about is owned by Indurama, okay? Yeah. Indurama produces only urea. Okay. Okay. They produce uh, the highest and purest form of urea in Nigeria. They are the largest producer and they are the biggest, produ largest producer by, both by pocket share and market share, okay? Now, okay. Um, I, I don't think that's really a game changer in the market. In the sense that you have more farmers using MPK than using urea. Okay. Okay. Go on. Okay. No. Go on. Go on. Urea, you use urea basically. What? What do I'm you with say? You go. Now you use urea basically in your grain production and your tubers production, but there's a whole lot more. There, there are a whole lot more places where you don't use urea. Like now, if you do so soybeans, you don't need to, you don't need to use urea. If you're doing um, if you're doing uh, what do you call it um, if you're doing um, um, tomato and other vegetables, there are a lot of vegetables that you don't need urea for. But that's by the way, the introduction of um, the 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 um, uh, launching of element in its sense has made urea more available in the market. But it's just a very tiny. Um, um, propeller in the wheels of of, of progress and farming. Now let's okay. let's let me, go, let me go, to Abdullah. go to Abdullah before I take questions. Which um, the, I saw Wale Hassan there also asked the question. Let me before you go to that. Let me ask as a um, as a coach and as a trainer as a consultant, Abdullah Hidris. Can you can you come online right now, Abdullah Hidris? Yeah, I can hear you. What would you say that the government of Nigeria is not getting right when it comes to the agricultural business? Because a land, a country with arable land and enough manpower to actually walk and till the spot. Why would you? And if you look, uh, what, what, what are the challenges facing the agriculture in Nigeria? Why has the business not gone beyond our uh, imagination, just like the oil has actually done? Because if you remember, we had the Grand Opinion and we have the cocoa in the southwest. But what drew us so backwards that the government is not doing right? Because we can only start, if we start, that's when these people actually come. Because the, this agribusiness is big business. Hello, Abdullah, can Hello. you hear me? Hello, yeah, can I can hear you. Uh, to start with, to start with, let me borrow the word of the former Minister of Agri, uh, that is uh, 
person of uh, how to be, where is it today's Nigeria has transited from being a self sufficient country in food production and supply to being a net importer, thereby spending about 11 billion on the importation of rice, especially and major, major cash crops into the country. So uh, we are blessed with uh, about 92 million hectares of land in Nigeria. But out of that 92, we have about 41% is the only percentage that has been cultivated right now. So if we go by that with that white cap, I think we still have a lot of potential, thereby reducing and improving the food security across, uh, across the country and indeed globally. Uh, what I can say from our rural farmers, from my interaction with the rural farmers, most of our farmers are, have uh, little sectors of land. Some of them are even not measurable up to an acre. So how do we get them from the subsistence level down to the commercial uh, farming system? So most of our farmers, they all cultivate their crops substantially. And what, what the problem is resulting to this is that many of them do not take the agriculture as a business. They just see that uh, we all come up, uh, we saw our father's farming and our forefathers farming, so we also inherited that farming into a cultural life. So let them have that mindset that agriculture is not a business. So having that in mind that agriculture is not a business, so how do you go about it? Because most of our rural farmers are at the receiving end. To start with, they don't have how much they, 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 they spend in the production activities, from cultivation of the land down to buying of inputs, the fertilizer, and other, the, the, the seed and other activities. I wish they, they, are, they have that orientation because their mindset has to be driven towards that. So there's need for a reorientation of their mindset. When they know that, this is how much I, I, I spend in cultivating the land. And by the end of the season, they are eager to go and get their money back. So you find out that they take their product at the market, whether we have a, uh, a crash in price, where most of the time it is the matter that enjoying the productive activities of the farmers, whereby the farmers become at the receiving end. So how do we go about that? We have to change their mindset, taking agri agriculture as a business. That is where the agribusiness model comes in. So we have to sit down and then visualize what model of agribusiness do we inculcate? And how do we bring it easy? so that our farmers can improve from farming per acre towards farming one hectare and then improving on it, thereby becoming a more commercialized agriculture. We have to identify the hope from each community what do they produce most and how do we assist them. We can even go ahead towards encouraging them, adding value to those products they, they produce, like processing into various Hello. I can't hear you. I'm with, please unmute your speaker. I can't hear you. Hello. Mr. Bakari, unmute yourself. I can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Abdullah, go ahead with your explanation. Okay. It's almost so, sounding cliche. It's almost sounding cliche that we are saying, oh, we need to reinvent the wheel. We need to do that. Because if I'm to take your mind back, um, yeah. the former minister, Audu Obe, he brought yeah. loads and loads of nice um, changes. Implementation is our problem. For instance, in Austrian states, the governor actually resuscitated the chocolate factory. That's Arab when he was there. He, but he ceded it to the Chinese. A whole lot of people were like, why would you be giving that to the Chinese to handle? When we are not, I'm not talking about just rice, yam, and all this. How can we make business out of this? Is the government giving them... Um, um, yeah. um, 
subsidy because food should be subsidized in this country, not just oil. If it's subsidized, that's when we will now have, like you can see, we just had um, the celebration. I can see some people bought a bag of rice more uh, as much as 2,000 naira, which is not supposed to. So what are we getting wrongly? What are we do not doing wrong? Before I come to the hydroponics, um, I mean, because a whole lot of people have actually come up with that. So what is government? Or can, what I, we can I make an interjection? Right? Can I make an interjection? Can I make an interjection? Okay, so okay. Um, go ahead. Mr. Abdullahi, Mr. Abdullahi was talking about get, getting to the roots of the problem and um, increasing the area cultivated by the smallholder farmers. And now, so basically, the smallholder farmers does anything between zero point six hectares to two hectares. Okay, so that's the average land the smallholder cultivated. Um, ninety percent of the production, uh, sorry, ninety-two percent of the production done in um, farm production in Nigeria is done by the smallholder farmer. Now, let's say this thing. Let's be clear about this thing. So uh, let's not mix word. Rate at which we're going. Yeah? Hello. The rate at which we're going. Yeah. The rate at which we're going. Yeah. No matter the kind of policies that we uh, we, we introduce, what in fact there's a current the, the new agri um, the, the the federal government's policy, the agricultural promotion policy. It doesn't matter who writes the policy. It doesn't matter who formulates the policy. If we don't change certain rudimentary things, it's not going to work. So let's um, imagine. I, I don't know where you are at the moment. So let me use um, Abuja as an example. Most of us can relate with Abuja and Environ. So somebody, uh, Mr. A, who is a smallholder farmer, is farming in Maitama. Mr. B, who is a smallholder farmer and is doing less than one hectare, is farming in Guarempa. Mr. C, who is also a smallholder farmer, is, is farming in Guagulada. Now you see how far apart these persons are. Get Now, yeah. when that happens, remember that they are farming on small, small pieces of land, okay? And it also means that their cost of um, uh, what do you call it? Their cost of production is going to go is going to increase. And if their cost of production is going to increase, it definitely means that their cost of sale is going to increase. It's going to be high. We've been talking about cluster farming, cluster farming, cluster farming. Okay. Um, back in the eighties, we used to have back in the seventies and early eighties, we used to have. Um, uh, uh, farming communities. We used to have um, uh, farm settlements, okay. And those farm, those farm settlements, to a very large extent, we are clusters, okay. A community owns the land, and or a large piece of land is that um, ten people, twenty people, thirty people, forty people, between ten to fifty people come together to aggregate their resources to farm on a very large piece of land. At the end of the day, each person might just be doing one hectare. At the end of the day, each person might just be doing less than one hectare. But when they congregate to, when they congregate and farm by side by side, what you now have is a cluster. Okay? And then when you have a cluster, what happens is your cost of production goes lower. Let me, there are three, there are majorly three things that affect our cost of production in Ninja. Cost of labor, cost of input, and um, uh, and weather, water, cost of labor, and um, inputs. Now your inputs, the chief input that usually causes problem is fertilizer. Now let me talk, let me let me let me pick each and every one of them one by one. I'm seeing a lot of questions, and I, I I would answer. I would like to answer them when I'm done with this. Yeah, yeah this is it. Go now, on, go on, go on, go now, on, go on. Cluster farming. So when Mr. A and B and C and D and E are farming side by side, it's easier for them to pull resources together and bring in one tractor uh, that work on the whole 50 hectares of land that they are cultivating in. But when Mr. A, B, C, D are down to Z are farming very far apart, because you're doing one less than one hectare. There's no need for you to go rent a tractor. 
Um, earlier this year, I was doing a uh, feasibility study in, in, um, in the Northwest and North Central. It cost to, to um, somewhere in Dumbogaji in the county state. And it, uh, uh, I went to a community from Kano and um, guess how they were plowing their land? They were using cows and uh, cows at, uh, with plows attached to them. Now, for each of those cows, for each every day the cow plows the land. Now, for every hectare, they pay the owner of the cow eight thousand. It's lower, but for them it gets the job done. But they would prefer to use a tractor. And guess one funny thing about the tractor? The tractors come all the way from. I mean, Kano main town. The tractor drives close to two hours before it gets to the community. And most, in fact, for all the for all the thirteen communities around there, I saw there was nobody and there was no place you could hire a tractor from. And when the tractor comes, the tractor charges them twenty five thousand naira per hectare to plow. Somewhere in um, somewhere in Joss, in Bocos, Joss. Remember, I said I did northwest and uh, northwest and north central. In Bocos, uh, they pay twenty two thousand there per, on uh, on uh, where they pay twenty two thousand there per hectare to run only plowing. And these guys, they do plowing, they do harrowing, and sometimes they do ridging. So you see. At the end of the day, the cost of production is already high. And these are individual farmers. These are not corporate, these are not cooperatives, and these are not farmers in cluster farms. So right now, we already have our cost of production going very high because of um, how far apart we are farming, how little uh, we are farming, and how very little. It Hello? Samuel, please okay. interject. I want us to be candid here, which yeah. is one of the reasons I want to throw you questions. Yes, it's past you and raise the, the problems in the data these um, farmers. What I'm saying here is maybe in the course of the program and on my platform, this is what I do. I release all the numbers of senators, House of Rep, to people out there. The people, I, I feel like he do so I'll, I'll call you after this. I'll call you after, after this. As in, when you release it, there is an air mark, because I, 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 I would have loved Governor Erufai to be on this, because I sent him a message. Each local government, each state, ought to provide this tool for farmers, like a subsidy. Here in Dubai, there's a benchmark for prices of poultry farms, poultry goods, and all of that. It can go higher than normal. Check in Saudi Arabia, most of them do not have all the um, farm produce they sell there, but it comes at a cheaper rate. It's because we do not talk in most cases. We know it, those farmers can, I understand the cluster farming and all of that. All of them can have that. It's because we need some people who would also love this um, idea I, I, see, if I want to join the agribusiness, I don't necessarily have to be um, a farmer or um, um, I have a, I, mean, I can do it as a business. I can just have the tractors and I'll rent it out. And after the season, I'll say, this is what, that's how we can break it down. Then, but we need policy. That's the reason I said we need to have it put down pen to paper. And if these people do not answer us, then we can take it up from there. What do you say, Abdullah? Let me take Abdullah, then I'll come back to you, Samuel, please. Abdullah, please. Then yeah, I'll help. The start for, just like uh, I highlighted before, I said the major problem of farmers is identifying the cost of production and then cost of sales. That is where I still keep on hammering on the reorientation. That is where the extension service is coming. We have a low depth of extension service providers. 
Many of our farmers don't know anything where to get the good seed, where to get the good fertilizer, the good fertilizer, the good cost, and how to go about the market. So without them knowing the cost of production, by the end of the season, they chopped up the market. This a farmer every day they become chopped up. The merchant there somewhere. By the end of the season, he shared the money to his guys. They visit, they visit the various uh, local markets and they mop up all those uh, commodities. After two months, the price stabilizes. It is the farmer that is still at the receiving end that will go back to the market and then buy at that cost, at that high cost. How do we counter this problem? One, I think. We have to give them a orientation that they have to come into cluster, form a cooperative. I have to give credit to this Brazilian government, whereby they have introduced a lot of policies towards boosting our food security, currently ongoing, which is agro geo whereby uh, cooperatives register with them and then try their economic cluster and then try their hectare of land that they will, they will go into production. They get an uh, off taker, uh, agree on the price that the off taker is going to obtake those commodities. Then they give them all uploads, habitats, and the rest of that. This, the the, the, the last that provide all those things at a giveaway cost to the farmer. And you will pay them with the number of parts that will cover the cost of that production. I think that one is an easy way to solve this uh, problem as well. The Anko borrowers have been there, which was launched around 2016 by the president of the present administration. That one also is a very good one. But the problem, where the problem lies, is the orientation. Many of them are not aware of all those policies that are going on. Who drive those policies? Who, who, who introduce the policy and then make them be aware that this, this is how, this is the way to go. That is why I say most of our state government have not cheated into this present agricultural revolution that is ongoing. They are all at the back side. It's an opportunity you, you, for every state to key in. Identify which are the major crops cash crop that we can produce from the state level down to every locality across the country. We have crops that we can produce and then making more money and then create employment as well as uh, improve the food security in our nation. As, how, um, uh, hello? Hello? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. I'm with yourself. I'm not here. I'm not here. Abdullah, go ahead with your explanation. We can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, just as I was saying, we have to improve on the value across the value chain. Just like, like uh, Mr. Hamid said, he said he can't be a tractor service provider. So, likewise, we have to improve from the production aspect down to the processing logistic and the marketing aspect as well so that is where i said we need a reorientation what model do we come up with on how to improve and then get ourselves out of this food security problem and then creating more employment and income for our rural farmers as well okay so, 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 so briefly briefly can i, can I just can I, say I, a little thing briefly yeah hello Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can give you an example. I can give you an example with the policy on the closure of border. You, uh, I can hear uh, somebody say that uh, the price of rice refused to come down, despite the fact that the border has been closed down and we are being encouraged to eat our local rice. There's no way the price can come down. In as long as everybody did not key in into the value chain, but by the time that everybody gets involved, we have an increase in production, we have an increase in the processing, we have an increase in the uh, distribution and marketing of it. I think with time, the price will take control of itself and then fall down. Because I can give you an example now with uh, my, loca my locality here in uh, Kano, like the Kura for Pasi. 
were, which is a hub for rice production. So when you go there, you see that everybody is involved, from the local woman that is milling the rice locally, down to the people that are take it away from you there see i want us to do this thing in such a way that we will be able to get the so the person that is doing the so you are paying him for his services the person that is moving the product from one place to the other you are paying him for his services let me let me let me see we have like to touch on we won't touch about the um the production out aspects we want to talk about the marketability of the product and the sustainability of it are you getting my point because we are still going about the problem what about how we can make business because if you're talking about this to maybe an individual a new entrepreneur it like it's like a no no area to go into are you getting what I'm saying? So I want us to like map out a strategy. Yes, first, let's agree. How many farmers do we have in the country? We should note it down. It's because we do not take this down. Do they have groups? Do they have a voice? We should make sure this thing is put in place. After that, there will now be a body to checkmate the excesses of the people in power. Are you getting my point? Me, I have seen the lacuna here from outside here. If all this produce can be well done, it could be exported and it will make a whole lot of difference for the farmers, for the middlemen, and for the country. The GDP will go up. I'm going to talk about the process. And Samuel wants to say something. Please, Samuel, could you take it from there? What's your opinion? Okay, because so, um, can, can uh, see, um, um, so when we talk about farming and agriculture, there's a whole lot of, um, how do I put it? There's a whole lot of misconception. Okay, so uh, I, I, it, sometimes it's ick, it's ex me when people make some conjectures about agriculture and call some figures and they, this one is exportable and not. So let me, be very, very, let me be very, very straight. Right now, there's a whole lot that we can't export. Reason being that our, um, our, our quality quality of the produce that we, that we have it's below par it's substandard do you understand we can't export the wheat we grow in nigeria why because it contains 19 percent more protein we can't export the maize we have we grow in nigeria because it has a lot of aflatoxin i i can just keep mentioning and keep mentioning but like i said hold on hold on hold on i'm gonna say something this is not uh, we're not trying to nail out the problems we're trying to talk about the problems and talk about the solutions mr Ab uh, Ab like said something about um, um said reorienting the farmers so he kept hammering the re orientation of farmers i can put it to you that um a whole lot of things are not going to change if you keep going that way so this is how it is i don't know if you heard of the word you've heard of the phrase or you've heard of the farm extension Farm extension officers. Now, ideally, ideally the farm extension officer um, is supposed to, for each one farm extension officer, he's supposed to be able to reach out to 800 persons. But in Nigeria, you have one farm extension officer to 5,000 farmers. What's the role of that farm extension According officer? According to you, again, it's supposed to be, is I said? What did it say? What's the role of that farm officer? I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. So the farm extension officer, so according to FAO, you, the farm extension, one farm extension officer is supposed to be able to reach out to 800 farmers. But in Nigeria, you have one is one is to eight, I mean, one is to 5,000 farm extension officer. So who is the farm? You know the way you have your veterinary doctor, right? You have your, your cow has a problem. Your dog has a problem. Who do you go to? You go to the vet, okay? Now, the farm extension officer uh, is your vet, is your crop doctor. He's the one who teaches you, he's the one who teaches the farmer uh, the good agricultural practices. 
but the farmer is not getting it right. The farm extension officers, you know, when you, when you hear about people going to train farmers, the people who train farmers are the farm extension officers. So recently in Nigeria, we, we've had we've had um, uh, a we've had we've had um, very little. Um, we have very few people in that farm extension service. The the ones from the federal government and state government, uh, trust me, rarely go to the farm. So the farmer is left, um, it's left at his own mercy to make his mistakes and learn from his mistakes. If we are experiencing growth, if we are experiencing any form of growth in the agriculture industry now, it is because of the private se sector. It's because people like Trevor Green, uh, from Crowdy, and all the rest of them are coming into the agriculture sector with their expertise. And it's because you have um, NGOs, um, 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 FAO, foreign body sponsored NGOs who are going out of the way, who have grants, and who's, which, whose grants are proposed to train farmers and all the rest of them. So if you're going to rearrange farmers, then you have to, you have to talk about farm extension services, farm extension yeah. officers, because if we don't get it right, the, the gap between the gap between how far we should go in production to, and where we are right now, the person who is covering that gap is the farm extension officer. It is not the state governor, it is not the local government chairman, it's the farm extension officer. So right I'm now, talking about the what you say? If the policy, if the policy is put in place. Whether there is a policy or no policy, Policy doesn't affect good agricultural practices. No, no. What I mean is this. Putting yeah. a bill to ensure that there is a farm extension officer in every farm. Bros, not Bros, the, 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 there has been... It's, it's there already. It's there already. It's like when you go to this... Uh, it's go to, when you go to the local government office uh, and you have, or you go to an MDA. In fact, let me, let me give you an example. There's an MDA that is in charge of seed in Nigeria. If you go to their website, eh, the contact address, the contact address, um, email address, and the phone number for the MDA, send a mail to them, you won't get a reply. Put a call through, numbers don't go through. And when they go through, nobody ever picks. You know what yeah. I'm saying? This is yeah, some policy that yeah. and balances, the, like the SON. You made a very valuable point. If that farm extension officer goes to the farm to educate the farmers, do you know when we started having food poisoning? It was because these farmers were putting too much of insecticide to kill um, insecticides. Uh, so hold, on, pet, hold, on, sorry, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I made mention of GAP, good agricultural practices. So I think, I think let's use the right terms. Good agricultural practices has a lot of things to, um, uh, covers a whole, it covers a broad topic from how you prepare your land to how far, how deep you put your seed. So how many seed you put in the hole to how many, how much water you put in the knapsack that you're using to, that you're using to spray. So how many cups of, how many milliliter of insecticide you put in a knapsack, how many milliliter of pesticide, I mean, pesticide or herbicide you put in a knapsack. And so at the end of the day, if you don't have your farm extension officers telling this person, eh, hey, this is the measure of this thing that you're supposed to use, then you have a problem. Your crops will grow fine, but you have more toxic food for human consumption. So I'm buttressing what and now the said. person who, right now, right now, yeah, right now, the person who is filling this gap for the farmer, eh? the person who is filling this gap for the average farmer in Nigeria right now is the impute seller. So the, the guy you go to, the guy, um, the farmer goes to, to buy, uh, what do you call it, his seed and his um, herbicides from. It is that same person that tells him, okay, this is how you, you're going to use it. And which is not supposed to be so. Do you understand? I'm and, saying, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, 
thank you. Um, that's why it's good we're on this platform and the world is actually watching and you're saying we're trying to make a difference through this platform. This is why we should have an, like, an EFCC for the farmers because the ripple effect will be um, um, citizen eating poison or toxins. You can say the world we are in right now, the COVID pandemic, that's a, a pandemic waiting to explode if we do not have the right people in the right places, which is one of the reasons I'm saying, yes, we're doing it because I don't want us to quickly too much dwell on this. I want us to also progress to touch maybe um, the business part of it and the export part of it so that we, will, we won't be looking too much oil because you could sit, sit down at home if they have like a thousand of you in the country, in the agri sector, I think we can all go back and flip and say, yes, we are producing good um, farm produce. I get what I'm saying. So we need you. Standard organization of Nigeria should do more. Keep them on their toes. Me, I'm up for the policy. Once the policy is there, once the bill is there, then we can write a petition to the House of Assembly or the State House of Assembly to withdraw these people or maybe like get the right people there, not by zoning. Okay. So let me go back to, uh, let me, let me go to the, um, uh, because most of the, our farmers, they barely go for conferences. The agri business conference, they barely go. You personally, have you go, how many conferences have you gone this year or last year? Okay. Um, uh, for me, uh, I, I'm always, and every month, month, every month. Somebody say something. Sorry? Okay. Every month, every month, I'm always in one training or the other, be it a group training or no, I'm, I'm researching. So I, I'm, I'm not really bound by conferences and webinars. I, I have a lot of research. Remember my, comp we, we work with data, we work with numbers, we work with figures. Any operation that we carry out, it's data backed. And so let me say something. Let me say, um, I was going to say something why we are trying to, why we are, why we are talking. Um, the agriculture sector, uh, it's, it's not like um, um, a lot of sectors, okay? And so um, progress, progress to a large extent is, is dependent on the kind of environment the government gives us. Now, having said that, um, we, let's, let's break agri the agribusiness sector yeah, into three um, into, into three phases. So we have the upstream, we have the midstream, we have the downstream. Okay, we have the upstream, we have the midstream. Everything in agriculture is broken down to three streams. Upstream, midstream, downstream. Now for the upstream, upstream is your primary production lies in. What is primary production? Active farming. Any form of farm engagement, any form of primary production. Okay, any form of farming activity lies in primary production. Okay. Midstream is where you have logistics and other value added services. Huh? You have logistics and you have imputes and all the rest of them. All the imputes providers and what so that's where the midstream is. Okay, then you now have the downstream. The downstream is where you have the processors. Okay. Now, so anybody who wants to come into um, anybody who wants to come into the agriculture sector must not necessarily jump to the upstream, which is where the primary production is. Um, up until recently, every um, every tomato that leaves the farm and comes down to Lagos State. Or comes down to um, um, Potakot market eh? is bagged in the raffia basket, and when it's bagged in the raffia basket from um, say from Joss, from Pangshi in Jocks to uh, um, my, my own market in Potakot, you're going to experience from the farm to uh, that market, you're going to experience a minimum of 40 percent loss. Why is right now, right now, you now have people who use um, re, uh, replaceable plastics. I mean, replaceable plastic baskets. 
Okay, so yeah, when you go to your supermarket, you see you see those baskets, those plastic baskets that have um, that are using. Yes, now with that basket is well rated for uh, for the tomatoes and the pepper to to stay in comfortably without um, without spoilage. You can stack them up on top of each other on the lorry, and you're not going to experience that level of wastage that you experience in your 911, in your um, in your 30 ton truck and your 60 ton trucks. Now, having also said that, that plastic crate is a lucrative business right now. Yeah. I know people. In fact, I know a lot of people in Lagos. I know a lot of people in Joss. I know a lot of people in Kano. I know a lot of people in Castina. I know a lot of people in Kaduna. Who all they just do is buy plastic crates. They buy in five hundreds. They buy in one thousands, and people come rent them. Wow, hundred naira per basket, fifteen naira per basket, whichever prices depending on the locality. And these guys are they are cash deep, and you don't need to service the plastic baskets. That's the funny thing. The merchant comes to release it from you. He listens it from me. He takes it to wherever he's moving the commodities. After moving them back, after moving it, he brings them back to you. And you're making your money. It's like when you, or you buy a machine and you have to be serviced. You, this one, you don't need to service it. It's a one-time installment. You can use it for the next one year, one year plus, 18 months. Then you now buy a fresh dozen. These are value as uh, other services. In the midstream, my company, one, one of the things we do is, one of the things we do um, for large scale farmers, this is not for small scale farmers. So for it's for anybody doing 100 hectares upward. So we do, um, um, like I said, we do primary production. So, so we do maize, we do castor farming, we do soybeans, we do wheat. Now, if, you, if you're planting 200 hectares of maize, 200 hectares of maize is um, uh, multiplied by, that's 750, uh, uh, I think around 500 acres. I think so, 200. But that's why we 200 hectares of maize. Right now we're doing 500 hectares of maize. But let me use 200 hectares of maize as an example. For you to do, for you to go check, go around 200 hectares of maize, eh? and check how healthy. Because you have to, you need to check crop health. You need at least minimum of 10 people on that farm go around the farm to check for army warm and all the rest of them to check crop health. That is 10 people that you're paying salary. And you're not checking it once, you're not checking it twice. It's a continuous check. You have to do crop health is something you have to drive. Around. So you're using bike to drive around the farm. You're using, you're using bike or, uh, or car or whichever, or you're walking. You get some people to walk around the farm to look for crop health. Which part of the farm, which part of the, the uh, farm, uh, which part of, uh, which section of the farm are the crops not doing well? Do you understand? Right now, with our GIS uh, remote sensing tools, from the comfort of my house, I can be in Lagos and I can view your farm as long as I have the coordinates to your farm. I can tell you this, is, this section of your farm is not doing well. Remote sensing tool, GIS tool, right now, I can, from the, from, from the comfort of my farm, I can measure the land of your the uh, the land on which your farm sits in the size of your farm. In fact, we're getting in some more tools. We're developing more tools. I can even tell you before your harvest how many tons you're going to get per acre or per hectare. This part of your farm is going to give you so so, so tons per hectare. This part of your farm is going to give you so so, so tons per hectare. Right now, we're developing tools that can tell you. At this, this part of your farm, eh, the water in this part of the, the, the water in the soil in this part of your farm is low compared to this part of your farm. These are value added services that comes in midstream. So, and people are paying so much money for it. 7,000, um, so spraying, eh, if you're going to, if you do make a nice spray, it costs you around 7,000 naira per hectare. On the average, and if you produce maize, you're going to be spraying at, at least three times. You're going to be doing, um, um, you're going to spray your herbicide twice, pre and post planting. Then you're going to spray at least once for uh, pesticides 
for the control of army worm. So that means at the end of the day, you 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 spraying three times. Seven thousand times three is how much? Seven thousand times three is how much? Twenty-one. So yeah, so per hectare you're spending twenty-one thousand naira per hectare for spraying. And if you're going to get, if you use that is if you're using um, a tractor to come spray. Now, if you get a tractor to come spray for you, the person is not going to come if you're not doing anything above hundred thousand. I mean, above hundred hectares, or at least minimum, minimum fifty hectares, because the person is not going to move. The person is not going to move his tractor from wherever he is from from st this state. Let's say I'm in Niger State because our farm is in Niger State. The person is not going to move the tractor from Kwara State to Niger State if if the, if I'm not doing large numbers. Do you understand? And so, like I said, you're spending twenty one thousand naira per hectare. Now, we we have drones. We have drones that can do the job for you at three thousand naira per hectare. That is three thousand naira per operation. So at the end of the day, you're spending nine thousand instead of twenty one thousand. You're getting twelve thousand. Do you understand? And these services are midstream. All form of mechanization fall under midstream all form of mechanization. I can tell you, I can count the number of harvesters, combined harvesters we have in Nigeria, which is not supposed to be so. That is the, by the time people are harvesting manually, you lose, you lose at least minimum 17% of your, 17% of, of your harvest when you're harvesting manually. Rice, 93% of the rice being harvested in Nigeria is done manually. And at that scale, tell me how you're going to make money. The, 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 um, the average, average yield of rice in Nigeria is 1.8 ton. The average yield of maize is 1.6 ton. Meanwhile, Brazil is doing 20 ton per hectare. Massachusetts in the US is doing 14 ton per hectare. Norway is doing 40 ton per hectare. And Norway is not... Lagos State has... The population of Lagos State is bigger than the population of Norway. Yet, they are doing 40 tons per hectare. So how are these people doing it? It brings us back to good agricultural practices. The average, the average farmer in Nigeria is using NPK. NPK, NPK 2010. NPK is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So right now, almost every farmer, whatever crop you're planting is using NPK 2010 or NPK 15, 15, 15, which is not supposed to be so. So ideally, they tell you, you they, you're supposed to do soil test, you're supposed to do, um, you're supposed to do soil test uh, before you plant. So after doing soil test, the, the farmer still goes back to do NPK 2010, which is not supposed to be so. So I, you're supposed to have a crop and soil specific fertilizer. Do you understand? When we talk about fertilizer, fertilizer on its own is a, is a very serious is a very serious case. What about storage? Storage facilities. Uh, st storage facilities. We we have very few storage facilities. In fact, I, I, I was, at some point, uh, the question uh, is not really about storage facilities, but how we store. Okay, you are talking about food. Problem. Let me give. Let me shock you. Some of the times. Some of the times, the beans you eat is not healthy. Yeah. You know why? Because the farmer who farms the beans, when he finishes harvesting, he puts them in the bag, they put them in the bag, right? And when you start them, so that when the market price, when, so that the market price, uh, what do you call it? Uh, so you can sell them for, uh, at a premium price in the marketplace, right? You wait for the, when the market, when the price is, is, is um, it's very okay, when the price are very high or when there's low, when there is high demand and low supply, you bring out your, with you, you bring out your beans and sell, right? Scarcity, you create artificial scarcity and all the rest of them. Blah, 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 blah. When this thing happens, when you store these beans, what happens? Weevils, when you buy your beans and bring it to the house, you sort your beans, right? Yeah. Why do you sort your beans? Because of death and because of weevils. Those weevils are not dead. Those weevils, you see them, they grow. They only grow when uh, they get that, they, they, they become that much at storage. So the farmer, for him not to have too much weevils, eh, and this thing, he sprays the bees 
with pesticide. Harvested beans already. Some spray it with sniper. Some spray with other form of pesticides that are not that are very toxic to human consumption. At the end of the day, you eat beans and you see yourself purging. And you think you just tell yourself, oh no, I'm allergic to beans. No, you're not allergic to beans. So the question now is, question now is are we, are we, is the food that we're the eating that we're killing, killing, us killing us more than it should protect us? So you look at all these things, you tell yourself, man, I don't know why I'm continuing. Somebody keeps muting me. Abu, is my time you? up? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, because somebody keeps muting me as I'm talking. Somebody keeps muting me. I saw, I was wondering about the time. Okay, so basically, so when you look at all these things, you tell yourself, first of all, am I playing in the upstream? Am I supposed to be playing the upstream sector? Am I supposed to be playing in the midstream? Am I supposed to be playing in the downstream? Cassava, cassava, eh? Cassava, let me give an example of, let me use cassava as an example. Eh? Um, a ton of cassava goes for around, right now, around 25,000, 25,000, between 25 to 40,000. In fact, averagely in Nigeria right now, uh, a ton of cassava averages between 17,000 to 40,000. 40,000 is the highest it has ever gone. Do you understand? Yes, 40,000 is the highest. Now, coronavirus, because of the spread of coronavirus, the price of cassava has really increased. I think right now it's around 37,000 per ton. No, cassava, 37,000 per, per ton. But do you know that that's cassava when you peel it and process it into flour, or you process it into cassava chips. Let me use cassava chips as an example. A ton of cassava chips is 147,000 naira. A ton of cassava chips. You see the very, you see the vast difference between when you process commodities and when you sell them. At, so at the end of the day, we need to first of all, break these things down. Okay, let's I think, break. We I need think, to first of all, stratify. Sorry, Samuel. I yeah? think you've yeah. given us a good um, tutelage on agriculture. I think we should hold this seminar because we kind of finish all of this because there's a wealth of experience you have there that we could actually, I need to help us in a nutshell. Because if you actually break all this down, this could create employability for our youths out there who are not working. And if we could actually, it's just about crossing the T's. Me, like I, I, I see here, what baffles me here in Dubai is having an Asian person, an Indian, coming to Nigeria, buying our produce in tons and selling it the way he likes. And we, that we are Africans, we find it difficult to, to get it. And it's very, very- Don't worry hard. yourself. See, let me give you an example. Uh, the largest cassava plant in all your states is owned by Indians. The largest no, no, cassava I'm, processing plants. I mean, sorry, I mean, Chinese. No, I'm coming. I know all of this as a journalist. What so, I'm see, yeah, is, see, 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 hold on. Uh, do you know one of the reasons why this thing is so? Uh, one of the reasons why we can't readily compete. One of the reasons. Who's, uh, wait, wait, who's muting it? No, who's muting it? Please, who's muting it? Where's Samuel? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. The, one of the reasons why we can readily compete. Hello? Hello, I yeah, can you're you're on. On. yeah. One of the reasons why we can't readily compete is because of our low yield. See, uh, if you're selling, if you're getting two tons per hectare, oh, no. Like I said, your rice, eh? the average farmer in Nigeria is getting 1.8 ton for rice or maize, whichever one. If you get a 1.8 ton for maize and the guy who is in Norway, the guy who is in Brazil is getting 20 tons per hectare, the amount is going to sell, he can afford to lower his prices. So you... It's like when they tell you, uh, when they say the, um, um, in the, in the, in the, 
in the in the land of the blind men, the one eye man is king, right? That small one where you get he big for you. Now your heaven and earth. So what do you do? You place premium price on it. First of all, you have to you also look at the, your cost of production because you, your cost of production not already is is already high, and you have to make profit, right? But the guy in Brazil, the farmer himself, he owns a lot of tractors. The government is subsidizing tractor fee for him. The government is subsidizing the price of seed for him. The government is subsidizing the price of um, fertilizer for him. The government is ensuring that he has easy access to markets. The government is waiving taxes for him. And so at the end of the day, it's very easy for him to sell very, very low. Let me shock you. By the time the... Um, the landing cost of maize in Upper Power Wolf, Lagos State here, is around 60000 The landing cost. Meanwhile, on a very good day without coronavirus and all the rest of them, uh, did I say 60000 Around 50000 Meanwhile, the, um, your maize at harvest, the, it goes for around 60000 By type, harvest of maize is around August I mean, September, October, there about. So it's around um, 60,000. Between October, no, September, yeah. Between October, November, it begins to climb up about 85, 86, 87. By November, December, it's already edging around 90,000, 95,000. By January, it's already, if at most, at most, it gets to 100,000. Okay? Then January, February, it begins to come down again. 100,000, 97,000. By March, it's come down to 75,000 because by March, you're already having the first set of maize that is coming into the market. So the question will be but, now, what's the but, way forward? What's the way forward? We, we, our, the way forward is we need to, first of all, increase our yield. We're getting very, very low yield. We need to reduce our cost of production and increase our yield. And there are already good models for us to increase our cost of, I mean, to increase our and reduce our cost of production. One of the best, one of the models we talked about was cluster farming. So if you're doing cluster farming, if you're doing cluster farming, there's a very high chance for, of, of you to reduce your yield. Then you talk about mechanization. Mechanization, we, we are dying in agriculture because a lot of our processes are not automated and, not me and they are not mechanized. The smallholder farmer is still using is still using 13th century and 14th century ways of agriculture. When you read your Quran, when you read your Bible, you, you realize that the, the cow and plow, huh? the cow and plow way, uh, means of um, plowing the land was what they were using then. And why the heck are we still using these processes now? So, that's just a whole lot. I think I've said so much, sir. I, 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 I don't want to hog no, no, the floor. I, I there are a lot of questions to be answered. And I'm very sure my colleague, uh, Mr. Abdullah, has so much to say. So please. Uh, I'm looking for Mr. Abdullah because he was, I'm trying to search for him. And um, I, 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 we need more of this to call this meeting, before we can call this meeting to, um, to an end. The thing is this. This is a fight for all of us and this is how we can emancipate ourselves i want from what we've gathered here so far i don't think we are going to stop here because like i was saying some the other time about um, an indian actually bringing the stuff here you have some people who are migrants here who are even looking for jobs if for instance i partner with a nigerian who brings those from Nigeria, and we set up a company here, we we'll employ Nigerians. I went to the Sheikh, I said, most of these farm products are brought from Pakistan, India, but we have better produce in my own country. So I see no reason why we shouldn't be having a bilateral stuff when it comes to agriculture. And ours is even better. I can tell you for free, that even our beans that you were trying to talk about which i also agree with you some here are not as good as our beans back home do you want to talk about the banana or the plantain 
The ginger, um, the millet, which is one of the reasons every individual on this platform and in Nigeria by extension who is actually into farm or into production to make sure we get into this market because we have a large population of immigrants here. And he could do the marketers or the speakers a lot. Are you getting my point? So because I don't want people to get um, um, discouraged by it because this is a platform that would help every single individual on this platform if we do it well, if we push away greed. If it's yam that you have, send it forward. You see, it's because we don't always have regular buyers. That's why we skyrocket all our produce. You see people, I want to ask you the question, Samuel, about the storage. I didn't mean it to be okay to create untold hardship or scarcity. I meant it for preservative, you know, they have, we have these products, seasonal. So if you have storage facilities, some will be there. And you, if the government put a policy that a benchmark, if there's a subsidy in it, the prices won't go up. In fact, some would even go down, to, like here, every Thursdays and Fridays, prices of goods do come down. They do sales every Friday, Thursday and Friday. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Why can't we have that in our system, in a land where we have, there was a time I went to Benue, oranges and yam were smelling, it's just we, don't, we, have, we have bad roads to bring it out from the farm. And they were big. I've never seen a, a mango in my life as big as those I saw there. So when I was telling people here, like, you people do not even understand what we have in my country, what we have, without even putting any um, artificial additive to it. This thing grow big. I think they call some um, kerosene uh, mango or something. You see. So, um, uh, Mr. Abdullah, I would like you to jump in on this to educate some of us, because some of us, we are going to wrap this thing up. We're going to have a phase two of this, God willing, because the yeah. wealth of have, uh, Samuel is uncanny, and we need a whole lot of people, and we need to draw, ring the, um, the alarm into the ears of our minute leaders. And if they don't want <laughs> our bidding, we vote them out. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Bakari. Just as we have highlighted, Agribusiness is the way out. Okay. Towards bringing our youth back to business and then engaging them into making more money and then uh, keeping them busy. So all those, you, you have explained a lot of things that we need more investors. Earlier on, I said the major problem facing our farmers is the production risks and then the market risks. Production risks in the sense that they have to get more knowledge in the production aspect. Uh, what is the quantity of fertilizer I need to, I need to put to, to cultivate my crop? What is the space in request per time to get an optimal yield for a particular crop? And then the market rate also. What time do I sell having known my cost of production? So I uh, remember back in the days when we were growing up, we used to have the marketing board where farmers bring in their, group, uh, their, their harvested crops and then the marketing board mop it up and they give them at a good, at a good uh, even price. It also gives them a room for storage also for those that are not willing to sell at that particular time. You can store and then make use of it at the required time where you need it. Then uh, it also gives them a room to assess form for further production of their crops as well. So I wish we can get back the marketing board just as it's obtainable before. I think we will go a long way. Then okay. I can uh, still add up with the uh, previous government uh, program, uh, which is the GES, Growth Enhancement Support Scheme, where the government subsidized all the input given to the farmer. Before that, I think we, we used to have a database, a complete database of the farmer across the country. So based on the database, we make projection. This is the quantity of seed we require for so-so year. And this is the quantity of fertilizer. This is the quantity of herbicide. 
But now, I don't think we have an updated data, farmers' data. So how do we go about that? We have to come back to the basis and then get the proper data for our farmers. This will give us a very good opportunity to, for proper planning okay. and then improve on our agricultural productivity. Thank you uh, very much. My good friend, Mr. Samuel, who was, said about, he was talking about subsidizing input and machinery. Hello? Raising a hand. Please, if you have any contribution, please signify, then I could unmute Hello? it and let you jump in. Hello? Hello? Hello, uh, Mr. Abid. Hello? Hello, Mr. go Abid. ahead. Your name? Hello? Hello, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, Hello? I should go ahead. Am I still? Hello? Go on, go on, go on. Who is... Okay, Mr. Abid. Yeah. Um, Hello? Am I still on? Yes, you are Hello, on. Mr. Abid. Am I still on? Please, who's that? Is this Omolowo? Can I talk? Act to log. Go, go ahead. I should go ahead. Yes. Oh. Hello? Hello, please talk. Okay. Sorry, gentlemen. I, my name is Shola Olusha. It's our related business. I was actually I joined this meeting purposely when I saw the, 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 the title, Agri Business in Nigeria, Prospect and Challenges. It sounded interesting to me, and I've enjoyed all the speakers so far. I just want to call our attention to one of the challenges that I think is a major issue, that is power. I'm into power business. I will just make this as a kind of contribution. Perhaps in subsequent meeting, if invited, I will elaborate on this area. So far, so good. We've been having challenges about power here and there, especially in the area of storage and preservation. The other colleague was making reference to low yield. To my understanding, power is also part of the factors that are contributing to this low yield. So far, so good. People have tried a series of ways on generating electricity, which include solar power, hydro, fuel, and wind. But it is a good news to let you be aware that we, uh, we perhaps have a breakthrough on how to generate power through gravity. Gravity is what we are looking at now to generate power, especially to farmers, those who are into agriculture, who are perhaps out of the grid, those who are off grid. I would like to stop here for now, at least that is where I want us to have in mind. The gravity means of generating electricity has no power, uh, sorry, doesn't require solar, which is the sun, doesn't require hydro, whereby we'll be looking for a dam or a natural waterfall. It doesn't require Thank you. Thank you it doesn't need require it. wind as well. But it is gravity. I I, I think Abu, please take note of that. We will talk about that. We have a particular day on that because it's very germane to the agri business. Thank you so much. Is that all? That's all, that's all for now. Okay, Thank you. the next person is Omolowo, right? Yeah, he's been indicating that he would like to speak. Can you unmute? Hello? Go ahead, speak. He seems to be speaking, but we can't get him. Okay, go ahead, speak. Please unmute from your end. Then I think um, uh, Mr. Abdullah Idris is trying to say, I can see his hand, please. Uh, Omolowo, can you can you can you hear me? Yep. 
I can't, maybe you have to unmute from your end. Oh, sir, I would suggest that he will just drop in the chat so we'll see his contribution on the chat. Type it. Type it. Type your question because we can't, we can't wait. Well, let me wait for another person to actually uh, participate. May, um, Mr. Hitris would like to say something. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to add up uh, to the other opportunities that still exist. Just as I was saying, I said uh, we need to improve on the, our research institute. Mr. Samuel raised a point on the yield. We have a very low depth of yield in our productivity. That is why our research institute has to sit up and then bring out more crops that are high yielding. Likewise, in terms of processing and then mechanization, the government has to do more, or maybe we have to pop in investors whereby mechanization can come into our rural farmers and then improve their uh, productivity as well. Processing also is also a very good opportunity. I can remember that I was uh, having a discussion with a friend in UK where we are trying to go into partnership in, the, in our uh, food stuff here because he said they are in high demand there in the UK. He even, uh, I think he even sent me a picture chart of, uh, of a product from here in Nigeria. That is uh, the young flower. Which, which is just 1.8. Yeah. Yeah. That's about a mood of a uh, young flower. I, can't, I don't know how much it's sold here, but I know it can't be more than five to 600. But there in the UK, a package young flower, which is just one mood, was about 10.99 euro. And if you convert that, that is about 5,000. Just a processed product. So, which means we can go a long way towards processing our product and then get a very good market out there and then improve our livelihood as well i think it's not just about the markets it's about yeah. the and, quality uh, like um samuel actually pointed out then because now with the advent of covid there is this yeah. test they test it goes through a test the food yeah. if it's mm -hmm. standard of a particular region yeah so the quality has to be put into consideration whenever it's being packaged or it's been yeah. um, trying to be imported. So I think so that, is where, that, that is where uh, the reorientation of our farmers still lies in, because we need right. serious reorientation of our farmers. That is why we need to em engage more extension officers, just as I like think, uh, think Mr. Samuel stated, know. that in Nigeria we have. One extension officer to 5,000 farmers. How do we cut that down? How do we improve on that? We have to can engage say, more. Can I say something? I'm yeah. saying now, as this group, this platform, we would nominate some people. Yeah. And we could tell um, yeah. somebody to educate some, or maybe train some people. And we will write to the Ministry of Agriculture yeah. that we have people. They can work. Yeah. I need to create employment for them. Yeah. Anybody who's coming to a farm, to a farm of a farmer, the farmer yeah. is meant to pay, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this, with this, if you have offices who will be going to each farm areas, those of them will be will be people of integrity, yeah. as you can tell. So that will create jobs for some yeah. people. The crates that he mentioned, that would also create job for some people. There sure. is a lot that we are looking beyond here. Yeah. So if yeah. we can get our acts together, I think yeah. um, in the Kuduka, we have a meeting. Abu and um, we'll, we'll lobby to the, the state yeah. as well as the House of Reps. Yeah. Then we could talk actually, about actually, actually, a lot of uh, opportunity lost during the post-harvest handling from from the farmer's side. Okay. Let's take, for instance, the tomato production, for instance. A farmer produces a tomato, by the end of this uh, harvest period, it doesn't have a market to take it to. At tomato are perishable. By yeah. the end of the day, the farmer gets to lose a lot of money after undergoing the production processes. So that is why we need to channel a lot of 
emphasis on the processing aspect. What do, how do the farmer handle his harvested product? What are the post harvest handling that he need to carry on so that he add value to his tomato and then add, got more money? Noted. Any other question? <laughs> Any other question or contribution? Okay, so um, I, I would like to I would like to state this um, for the record. Um, okay, Mohammed, Mohammed, imagine. Hello. Let's. I'm finish and I'll call you. So I would like to state this state this for the record. Okay. Um, before the time runs, we've been doing a lot of. We've been, we've been talking about a lot of challenges in, agri and in, the, in the agriculture sector. So, for people who are not in the agriculture sector, they would, they would think that hey, uh, this is not this is not a go, uh, this is not a go to area. This is this is not a place I would want to invest my money. No, calm down. Every 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 sector has its own challenges. Okay, we we'll just we we'll, we're just simply pointing out the challenges in this sector, and this. Challenges are not without. Um, they are not without um, um, solutions. But I would also say this: if your if your plan is to come into the agriculture sector and start and, and start making billions at once, hey, calm down, please. There's a big reality check for you. So, if you're gonna if you want to make money in agriculture sector. Please forget about doing it in the subsistence level. Okay, there there is really uh, not much money to be made on the subsistence level. Okay, there is more money to be made on the large scale level. You don't have to own it all. You can pull resources together. You can you can collaborate. You can form a cooperative and do it in the large scale. I see what the guys in in Nassau State are doing with Sesame. Yeah. And some other couple of products, people are doing amazing things with um, in, 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 um, to pull resources together and run large scale farming. I see, I see, I see people do it in in Kadawa in uh, uh, State. Yeah. So, irrespective of these challenges, there are solutions to this. And please, and please, and please, I keep saying, I sometimes I get scared when people say it and, uh, that the agriculture is the new oil money. It is true. Agriculture is the new oil money. But you have to do it right. And you have to do it large. Thank you very much. Now let me go on to Mohammed and I'll see if one is going to be the last person to talk before we run it up today till another time. Mohammed, go ahead. Mohammed, go ahead. Good afternoon. Oh. Mohammed, can you hear me? Yes, I am with you. Let's call it spread a spread. Frankly speaking, the major problem of agriculture in Nigeria is our government. We are just trying to deviate from the real trap. The government is the major problem. I am an agricultural uh, uh, agri officer, extension officer. I work under Fadama. But it, our research institute is not working as it's supposed to work. They are not working properly. In fact, the government did not allow them to carry out their real mandate. That is one. Two, let's talk about the seed uh, industry. The person in charge of the organizations in charge or the ministry or the body, the agency that is in charge of the uh, seed uh, in the industry, they are not also given the right the right power to carry out their activities. Now everything has been divert to CBN. Then how are we going to get, get real input? And even the input they are to distribute to the farmers always at 11th hour. I'm giving the farmers what they are, what they are to cultivate at the 11th hour. Now 
So maids are still being distributed. What are they going to? What are they going to? Noted, noted, Mohammed. Thanks for your contribution. Let me go to Olo for the last time. Let's see if we can get your voice, and if we can't, we we'll call it a wrap for today. Um, Olo, can you hear me? Thank you so much. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? You are highly welcome. Thank you so much. You have thirty seconds. <laughs> thank you so. Thank you so much. My name is Olo Yadiniji. And I am also horn from UAE, Abu Dhabi to be so, to be precise. You see, I I study agri extension and management from KB State College of Agriculture, Zulu in KB State. And during my during my final year project, I I I try to examine the input of one program, food security program in the livelihood of the farmer in KB State. And there is one thing I saw during that, during that research programming, during that research, I discover agriculture in Nigeria has been left for the patient, for the patient farmers, those that are not educated. Educated farmers, as in agriculturists, are no longer going into farming. Farming yes. has been left to farmers. Yes. Now, again, when I was serving in Edo State, I served in Abudu. Abudu is a rural area. 95% of the dwellers there are farmers. I, I, I noticed the same thing, that farming in Nigeria has been left for the rural dwellers, the ones that are not educated. Now, I now came up with this. If the federal government can start a program we call Operation Catch Them Young, where the government will bring educated farmers right from, right from NYSE orientation camp, set them up in each of their local governments, they will be farming. At the, at the same time, they will still work as extension agent for the government. These are people that have agricultural experience. You can be a farmer and not be an agriculturist. You can be an agriculturist and not be a farmer. Agriculture is somebody that studies agric. Farmers is somebody that is farming. You are in the farm. Thank you very so much. We have a lot of farmers that are not agriculturists. We have a lot of agriculturists that are supposed to be farmers, but they are now in offices working, which does not have production in Nigeria. Governments should gather agriculturists and make them farmers. That we have production in the rural area. Rural farmers don't have much knowledge. What they have is their cake knowledge their forefathers have been using. Somebody have to take, somebody have to take the research from the research house down to the farmers in the rural area. But because government could not encourage these young educated agriculturists, they are not able to do that. So if government can cut them from the orientation camp, or from said, individual universities, go to the school and ask them from the. They said they, they said it all. It will help, Thank it will you very much. And and that's Nigeria. how far we can go on today's editions of the meeting. It has been noted that agri business firms are evolving in providing their own extension service. Providing agri business means an increase in cost, therefore, what motives we are all doing. On behalf of all that made this possible, I say a very big thank you to you all for contributing. I say thank you to Samuel, Idris, Oloyen, Mohammed, the Act to Log, and um, the likes of you that my, your name has actually escaped my memory right now. I say with this, this has been a production of the One Nigeria platform, and we hope to have a phase two of this particular topic because it's very germane to everyone. And God really. Will um, we'll get to the promised land. From all of us, it's bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>